many times when people hear tithing, they get a little lump in their neck or they get a little something in their stomach because people in church have been beaten down by those who have just talked about tithing. There are even churches that say your church membership is dependent upon how faithful you tithe. That is found nowhere in scripture. And so today, what I'd like to do is to untwist the covenants so we can have a better understanding. So please know this. Jesus said, if you continue in my or abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? The bondage of the law, the bondage of religion. And so for so many, we've been under the bondage of religion. We don't know whether we're coming or going. Now, the purpose of this study, it is going to, I'm starting on tithing today. I'm going to continue next week. But the purpose is not to dissuade you or to convince you that you should not give. That's not the purpose. The purpose is so that you are able to freely give from your heart without the threat of a curse. You see, we're not under we're not under the old covenant. So what I'm going to do is strip it all down. So when we build it back up, it's not built upon the law it's built upon grace and amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound. Amen. <clears throat> so let's begin in the text that I heard every week from a booming voice. Malachi three verses eight and nine. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? Verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, wouldn't that put a little fear in your heart? You're a little child and you hear a man with a booming voice. You have robbed me, all of you, the whole, you are, with, you are under a curse. And so you sit there trembling, thinking, do I have a quarter or something to give? I'm talking about as a child. Malachi was not written for Gentiles. It was written to Jews. How do we know this? God posed the question, will a man rob God? But you say, how have you robbed me? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse. Who is robbing God? The, the priests and the people. The priests were not giving the best that they were given. They were giving according to the law. They were supposed to give the very best, but they were keeping the very best for themselves and offering up tainted offerings to God. And the people were doing the same thing. Now, tithing came under which covenant? The old covenant. So the question is, who is being cursed according to the old covenant? The nation of Israel. Do you see this in the text? God will never curse those he has saved by the blood of his beloved son. Is God going to curse his own body? No. You see, but what happens is religion says, leave your brain at the door and just do what we say if you want to be right with God. No, 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 no. By the renewing of your mind, you become changed. You don't leave your brain at the door. God saved you so you can be able to think right, no longer under the bondage of the law, but according to grace. And grace gives us wisdom. Grace gives us freedom. Aren't you glad you're free today? God will never curse those he has saved. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the next time you hear some preacher say it, I said, no, nah, doc, you're wrong. You're wrong. That does not apply to me. I'm not cursed. I am blessed of God. Praise God. Because he became a curse for me. Let's, where do you find that, Dana? Where do you, how do you know that? Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, why did he hang on a tree? 
in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. And what is that blessing? The law? No. So that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. We didn't receive the covenant. We didn't receive anything from the old system. We didn't receive a thing. And until we understand that, we're going to have some twisted thinking. Your brain will short circuit because you think, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. And so what happens is you're not giving out of freedom. You're giving out of fear. And the Bible says anything that is not of faith is sin. The new covenant eliminated. There's no remnants of it eliminated the old covenant along now gets it says at the bottom here it says so that we would receive the promise of the holy spirit through faith along with the promised holy spirit comes the guarantee of eternal salvation and the church said amen, amen. malachi 3 10 bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this says the lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, or the King James, there shall not be room enough to receive it. So then you get a preacher saying, you see, if the reason why you're not blessed because you're not tithing, you're not giving into this ministry, you're not sowing good seed into good soil. This is good soil, so you need to, you need to sow seed. The reason why your tire blew out last week is because you weren't tithing. The reason why your, your, your water heater went out because you were spending money other places and not taking care of God's house first. Well, I heard that a lot. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you on the authority of the word of God, that is not true. The grace of God does not put you under bondage. And anything that puts you under bondage is not according to the grace of God. In Acts 15, the disciples, Peter said, why are you trying to put these Gentiles under the yoke of the law, which we ourselves couldn't keep? The apostles never intended for Gentiles to keep the requirements of the old covenant. But I know people say, oh, he's on Grego. You can do anything you want with your money. I didn't say, well, you know, really you can. Why? Because you remember Ananias and Sapphira? You remember that they were struck dead because they didn't give what they said they were going to give. They were not struck dead because they did not tithe. Go back and read it for yourself. We may look at it next week. They were not struck dead because they didn't tithe. Peter said the money was yours to do whatever you wanted to do with it. Didn't he say that? He said, whatever you wanted to do, it would have been fine. But because you lied to the Holy Spirit, you are struck dead. You can't try to say, well, they didn't tithe. It had nothing to do with tithing. It had, with them to, it had all to do with them lying to the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at biblical New Testament giving, giving as we go along. Question from this verse. Where was the storehouse which God referred to in this? Where was it located? In the temple. Where's the temple? Gone. Gone. We are the temple of God now. The temple to which he was referring to now in here is gone. It was destroyed by God on purpose, signifying the total destruction of the old covenant system. The sacrifices, the days of worship, tithing, the Sabbath, all of it gone. The dietary laws, Leviticus 11, all of it gone. So what was the purpose of the storehouse? To feed the Levites, to feed the priests. Are there priests today? I'm not a priest. I'm not a priest. I'm not serving in the temple. I'm not a priest. I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not a priest. So here's a question. Does anyone have the right to change the word food in my house to Money in my house. No. But people will teach, well, you know, we don't use grain now, so you need to change it to money. Says who? Says who? You see, when you use your brain, according to the word of God, things that you heard don't make any sense. And you start realizing how you've been manipulated all your life. 
Let's go to verse 11. And this is the promise. Then I will rebuke the devour for you so that it will not destroy your bank account, your 401k, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Is the church a delightful land? No. The church is not a nation unto itself. The church belongs to the kingdom of God. It is the body of Christ. And Christ will never curse anything attached to himself. Now, one of the provisions of the new covenant God promised Israel was a land grant and a kingdom. He promised them that. God has not nor will he ever cancel his promise to Israel. I don't care what the reformers said. I don't care what people, the, the, the uh, reform theology or replacement theology says. I don't care. God is going to keep his promise to Israel. Now, some argue, they'll say, okay, 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 Danny, we'll give you that. But then some argue and will say, well, Abraham paid tithe before the law, law was given. Abraham paid tithe. And that's true. That's true. Also, Noah went to an ark, didn't he? Because Noah went to an ark. Are you supposed to go to the ark? It, because uh, uh, the children of Israel walked into the Red Sea. Are we supposed to go to the Red Sea? Should we go to the, to the desert and start waiting for manna? Instead of going to the restaurant, wherever you're going after church. Huh? You see, it, it, when, you, when you use your brain, when you use your redeemed brain, some of the things you taught just don't make any sense. God did many things for one time. He had a person do one thing one time for a specific reason. And we're going to see the reason now why Abraham paid tithes before there was a law. Hebrews 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Melchizedek is a mystery person. They're all kind of writings. Well, who is Melchizedek? I mean, this, this guy, he just shows up out of nowhere. Could have been Jesus himself. Look, let, when you read the scripture, just go with what's in front of you. If it doesn't tell you, just go for, just go for what, what, what's in front of you. And we're going to look a little bit closely at what Hebrews has to say about Melchizedek. Now, why did this king meet Abraham? Abraham received news that his nephew and all of his family, his nephew Lot, that they were captured by this marauding band of, of, of uh, this army. Now, Abraham, in response, took 318 of his well-trained men and rescued Lot and all that was taken from Sodom. Now, the king of Sodom wanted to give Abraham, I'll give, he said, no, I'm not taking it because I don't want anyone to say that, th that you made me rich. He said, I refuse to let a heathen take the credit that God only gets. So Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem and a high priest of the most high God, blessed Abraham. What happened first? He blessed Abraham. And this is what happened in response. Verse two, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of the spoils, a tenth or a tithe of everything he had. Is that what it says? The spoils. To whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of the spoils was first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. What, who, who does that sound like? Jesus. Jesus. King of peace and also the king of righteousness and a high priest. So we see here that Abraham gave to this priest and king a tithe of all the spoils he got from the army. Got it? Okay. So he didn't on a regular basis give 
touch. He did not do it. Why? Because that system didn't come into being until the law was given to Moses. Verse three, without father. Now this is describing Melchizedek. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither being of days nor in beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like the son of God. He remains a priest perpetually. Now, this has caused confusion many times about Melchizedek. Was he some supernatural person? No, you have to understand Jewish thinking. Have you ever read, have you ever sat down to read the book of Numbers? That's one of the most exciting reads you'll ever have in scripture. He begat, and he begat, and he begat, and then he begat, and she begat, and he begat, and this, and that. And you sit there reading a bunch of names you can't even pronounce and try to retain it. But it's there for a reason. It's there for a reason because it showed the lineage. All of it was pointing to the lineage ultimately of Jesus Christ and how God was faithful to keep his people. So here is this Melchizedek who is a Gentile. He, he's, he doesn't have any genealogy. They don't know where he came from. They didn't know when he began. They have no way of knowing when it ended. It doesn't say that he lives forever, but he was made like the son of God, to appear like the son of God. He was a type of Christ, just as David was a type of Christ. David slew Goliath. In other words, he slew the very thing that his people were afraid of, death. Jesus Christ came and killed the giant of death, hell, and the grave. So today we are set free. That's as simple as, isn't that simple? All right. Therefore, because there was no genealogy, it says it right there, without what? Genealogy. No one knew. Verse 4. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. So what is the purpose of all this? Hebrews was written to whom? Hebrews. <laughs> it's really simple. The he book of Hebrews was written to the Jews. And the purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show them that Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Abraham. He's greater than the priesthood. He's greater than all things. That's the purpose of the book of Hebrews. So when you see tithing in the book of Hebrews, just know it's not about tithing. It's about Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that as we go. Verse five. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have, command, have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people. Oh, what's that word there? Have commandment in the what? Are we under the law? Okay. Have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. So now, strangely, he goes from talking about Melchizedek and he says how great this man is. He was so great that even the, the, the priests that were to come pay tie to Melchizedek because all the tribes that were to come were inside Abraham. Verse nine. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. It was from the tribe of Levi that the priests would come. Therefore, he was saying that this type of Jesus is greater than Abraham, greater than Levi, greater. He is a greater priest than any of the other priests. This is what he's talking about. Anywhere are you seeing him say, well, now you need to carry over this into your worship to God today. Are you seeing that anywhere in here? No, what he's doing, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Now he makes his point in verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. 
What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to be designated according to the order of Aaron? In other words, he was saying, well, if the priesthood was perfect, if this system of worship was perfect, why was there a need, a need for another priest who would be established apart from the law? According to the law, the Levites worked in the temple and a specific group, those who descended from Aaron. Okay. Verse 12. For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of what? Law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken, who? Jesus Christ belongs to another tribe, Judah, from which no one has officiated at the altar. It was illegal for someone other than a Levite to officiate at the altar. Therefore, he's saying this old system of worship is going to be, it's going to, the law is going to change. It's not through the priest that you have life. It's not through this old system. So don't get, don't stay attached to this old system because there's another priest coming who is contrary to the law of how a priest is established. So as we see, Hebrews 7 has nothing to do with New Testament tithing. It foreshadowed the physical descendants of Abraham who would collect tithes from their brethren as part of the Levitical system. It also foretold of the ultimate priest, Jesus Christ, who as Melchizedek was not from the descendants of Levi. Verse 14. For it is evident that who? Our Lord was descended from Judah. A tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So don't get stuck on the law because the law has changed. Amen. The law has changed. Verse 15. And this is clearer still. He said, let, let, let me, in other words, he said, let me break it down for you. And this is clearer still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Oh, that's good. Do you know that Jesus Christ, his life is indestructible? Aren't you glad about that? That means even though he died, Jesus, the man died, they could not destroy him. What did he do? He got back up. He got back up. And people will get dressed on Easter Sunday so you can look at them. But we get dressed in the righteousness of Christ so we can say, look at Jesus. <laughs> yes, we do. We get dressed up in his righteousness so we can say, look what God has done through faith in his son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, all the other priests had to continually, continually offer sacrifices for their sins and the sins of the people. But Jesus Christ, our high priest, offered himself for our sins according to the power of his indestructible life. He was fully God and fully man. Verse 17, for it is attested of him, meaning Jesus Christ, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's from Psalm 110, verse 4. The word of God is indestructible. You were born with incorruptible seed, an indestructible seed. The word of God that was planted in you by the Holy Spirit is indestructible. That's why the word says, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Why? Because he gave you his word. He planted the seed of his word in you and he gave you the Holy Spirit who germinates the seed so that you exhibit the fruit of the spirit. I tell you, 
People miss it. So, so, so caught up in trying to get people to do this and do this and do that. They miss Jesus. They'll stop. Earlier in Hebrews 7, talked about, well, Abraham paid tithe and missed the whole point of Hebrews 7. Jesus' reign and priesthood is forever. Verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and. No, he didn't say that. No, he didn't. No, he didn't say it was useless. Why? For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in. Oh, here, here it is. There is, on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Remember, the Old Testament system kept people away from God. Don't go here. Don't go here. You better not touch that ark. Don't do it. Don't, don't, don't come near me. Only these people can come near, near me. But because of Jesus Christ, he opened the gate. He rent the veil. Now we all have the right to come to him and cry out, Abba, Father, and let our request be made known. And he is faithful to hear us. He is faithful to love us. He is faithful to keep us until the very end. <laughs> Are you getting it? Are you getting it? Tithing is not the point. Tithing is not the point. Jesus Christ is the point. He is the beginning and the end. Melchizedek, he, he, he shadowed that with no beginning and no end. Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Man, he is the beginning and the end, but he, there is no end with him. It starts with him and it ends with him. Verse 20. And it is much as it was not without an oath. For they, meaning the Levites, indeed became priests without an oath, without a promise. But he with an oath or promise through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Well, when was that decided? Before the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Of the world before you existed, before the stars existed, before the angels existed, before the planets existed, before your little cuddly pet existed. Jesus Christ was determined to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Huh. So God, the father, made a promise to Jesus, the man, that he would be a priest forever because a human being served as a priest. That's why Jesus Christ put on flesh so he could be a high priest. Now, does this mean we ought to pay tithes to Jesus? No. Why? Verse 22, it has nothing to do with tithes. So much more, so much the more, also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So in other words, don't try to put Jesus in the old covenant. Don't do it. Don't, don't, don't do it. Because you'll find yourself all twisted. You'll find yourself, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. I need to do this. You put a weight on yourself that you cannot handle. You have guilt all over yourself and God has released us from the guilt. Amen. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't give? I didn't say that. I didn't say it. What I'm saying is you need to be set free from the lies that you've been told about our Lord and Savior. He is a new covenant. He is not the old covenant. He is a new covenant. Now we serve him in a new way with our whole body, with our whole self. And the Holy Spirit guides us as to what we will give. And he loves a cheerful giver. But if you're not able to give, you're not under a curse. Amen, somebody. We are no longer under the law, but under grace. And grace teaches us to say no to all unrighteousness. Stinginess is unrighteous. If a child of God is stingy, God will take care of it. He won't go to the law. He will go and he will discipline you to teach you how to give. How to, See, grace gives us wisdom. Instead of spending money on stuff that makes no sense, 
Grace causes us to prioritize what is important. And when we do that, we have more than enough for ourselves and we have enough to give. And what does John 3, 16 says? For God so loved the world that he gave. Therefore, we love him because he first loved us. Therefore, we give. You see the difference? You're not um, obliged to pay a tithe. I remember going to a church and they'd have a 15, 20 minute talk about giving. Every Sunday, you just want to get under the pew. They didn't have pews, they had chairs. You just want to get up under the pew, slide up under there because you felt, oh man, oh man, no, oh, ooh, not that. Had people say, you don't need to buy that new hat. You don't need, you have enough. But surprisingly, they came with a new hat every week. Oh, did I say something? <laughs> Verse 22 again, so much more. Also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Verse 23. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. He's a priest before the father. And I tell you, I, I tell you, uh, uh, Pat took the thunder. out. He, he already told you when he read from the scripture. But John 17, he was reading this morning. I said, look at the Holy Spirit priming the pump to get us ready to see what the whole purpose is. And as John read Jesus' prayer from John 7, as, as, as Pat read Jesus' prayer from, from um, John 17, it is also echoed in verse 25. The whole point of this whole discourse, here it is. Therefore, he, he who, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ what? Jesus Christ, our high priest and king, also is he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's the point. Abraham paid a tenth to Melchizedek to show that Abraham was not the pinnacle of a godly man. One in the light, according to the line of Melchizedek, would come. And who is that? Jesus Christ the righteous. He came. He paid for our sins. Now we give not under the law. We give because of the grace of God. And when you're grateful for something, you support it, don't you? If your favorite artist is going to have a concert, no one has to say, if you don't buy a ticket, you're under a curse. No, you're going to buy the ticket, don't you? You go ahead and you buy the ticket. What you love, you support. Therefore, out of the goodness of your heart, you do what it is you love. It has come from love, not because you're afraid of being under a curse. Brothers and sisters, there's no curse associated with God concerning you. Oh, I praise God for the, If you abide in my word, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Oh, I'm so glad that we don't serve a high priest that's checking to see. There was a church, they were checking the role to see whether or not you were giving. What you give is not their business, it's not our business. Because what we have to do and what we do is trust the Holy Spirit in you. Do we have a lot of money in the bank? I don't know. But a church doesn't need a lot of money in the bank. Because when the call comes, hey, we need help over here, what happens? You give and you give in abundance. That's what you do. Why? Because you love the Lord. So, no curse, no old covenant. Jesus Christ is a guarantee of a better covenant where we have life and life more abundant and everything we do, we do to the glory of God and we do because we love him. Even though we haven't seen him, we love him 
And we show our love by our love one for another and our desire to see the work of God continue. Now, I didn't preach this. I'll hit, let me hit. Let me tell you. I'm not preaching this. You're trying to make you, you know, try to manipulate you. No, no, no. No, no, no. If any of you felt manipulated, come and let me know. Because I won't do it again. I'm serious. But I'm here to set you free. To preach the word of God so you can be set free. Amen. Not to set your wallet free, <laughs> but to set you free. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. Father, we give you praise and thank you, Lord, that we can, we can exhale. You're not holding a gun to our heads. You're not holding a curse over our heads. Your banner over us is love. And Lord, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing. We thank you and praise you for your faithfulness towards us. Not because we give, but because you are giving. Thank you, Lord, for setting us free. Thank you for keeping us free. And thank you for the promise that you will set us free from this, this cage of decay, this body. When you come again and receive us unto yourselves, we will receive a new body, not because we gave, but because of your grace. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.